obviously lots of rumors circulating right now. You definitely are wearing many hats as it is and have in the past. So what's kind of going on with you right now? You know, I'm, I'm giving some serious thought to um, entering the race uh, to become the next national chief. But uh, at this point, I'm just, you know, talking it over with my family and people that I respect and trying to get their take on things. And also, um, you know, curiously watching uh, what the Chiefs are going to do with their decision next week on setting a timeline. So there's a, there's a variety of things that I'm thinking about right now. For sure. Yeah, this has obviously been on your mind for a bit. Um, when did you start thinking seriously about this? Obviously, with Sean Atlio stepping down, it shocked everybody only one year into his mandate. What, what kind of started to turn you in this direction? Well... You know, first of all, let me say I have a lot of respect for Sean, um, Sean Atlio. Uh, but after he resigned, I started getting calls from people, calls and messages, um, asking me if I'd ever considered it. And so, you know, I had, but it was something that I always considered uh, further down the line when I'm older. But um, once I got the message from people that I really respect, I decided to give it uh, a lot more th- serious thought. And basically... Um, it feels to me like there's a certain amount of urgency right now, uh, both because of all the issues uh, facing our First Nations communities and the fact that, you know, um, the First Nations uh, leaders, the chiefs, um, are looking for a, a very strong voice to represent them and to um, speak for all of their diverse concerns. But also because outside of our community, um, traveling around Canada these past number of years, I recognize that I think there's there's an unprecedented willingness on the part of other Canadians to try and imp- improve the relationship, to try and fix things. Uh, and so I think the challenge is to take that goodwill and do something meaningful for treaty rights, for Aboriginal rights, and uh, also for uh, First Nations children and uh, all of our community members. And you're coming in at a time where there is a lot of turmoil, right? We've got the Bill Mm -hmm. C-33, and we've got the missing and murdered Aboriginal women. What do you think about taking on those big challenges? Well, I think we need to define what it is that we're talking about. You know, the mainstream media wants to talk about the education bill in terms of uh, the graduation rates on reserve, but that's not it. The real... real urgent matter there is the fact that our schools get four thousand dollars less per student per year so i mean before we start trying to blame first nation students let's let's try and take a look at where the blame deserves to be which is on a system that is structurally stacked against the deck it's structurally structurally stacking the deck against our kids you know so let's 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 shift the conversation to where it needs to be similarly too with uh, miss missing and murdered indigenous women we know that if that was 1,181 missing and murdered Canadian women, if we woke up tomorrow and suddenly the murder rate for all Canadian women was four to seven times higher than what it currently is, there'd be chaos in the streets and the government would be, you know, running to action right away. So I think it's clear, you know, across the, those two issues, for example, but across many others, that First Nations people have the moral and ethical high ground Like, we are facing a a lot of serious injustices. And uh, I think that we can make the case persuasively, not just within our own community, but also to the rest of Canada, that now is the time for action. Now is the time for everybody to work together and make things better, uh, both in terms of the relationship, but also in terms of uh, the, the grassroots people in our communities. Oh, for sure. So if this were to progress and you'd commit to this challenge and uh, become the next Grand Chief, what what would be your first order of business? Well, I think, um, there, you know, first of all, it's, it's all hypothetical. Eh? Right. But if I did decide to, to pursue this and I was lucky enough to win the support of uh, Chiefs, you know, what I'd really want to do is to just get it back to consensus. Um, internally within the AFN and to me that means making sure that even where there there are disagreements about approaches on how to move forward that we recognize and respect all the voices at the table and we try and build from a basis of respect towards consensus 
And consensus doesn't necessarily mean unanimity. It doesn't mean that everybody 100% agrees, but at least it means that everyone's had a chance to speak their piece and that we've forged a common direction out of that. So I think that that's, that's fundamental. At the same time, I think that um, the grassroots are very powerful. The young people in our communities are very powerful. We have a very young population. And so their voice needs to be included. And I think that down the road, that means um, letting the, the governance structure of the assembly evolve into something that more closely resembles the consensus-based traditional governance uh, models from our communities. Um, but in the short term, just as somebody in that office, I would try and uh, be very open and transparent and use social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, to keep people in the loop as to what's happening, what are the deliberations, what are the pieces of legislation coming down which may affect our communities, what are the social issues that we're facing, not just missing and murdered Indigenous women in education, but also suicide, prescription drugs, um, family violence, any number of issues. What can we do about those things? That's to right. Use, uh, the media to reach out to, to our people and also to use it to listen and to, to seek consultation and to seek direction from grassroots people. So I think that um, I think that it, it's really key for us to move forward on these issues facing our community, but we also have to look internally and try and uh, work really hard to forge, uh, to forge an inclusive uh, consensus based uh, direction for uh, First Nations, uh, you know, to, to move ahead. For sure. And with your media background, obviously, because sometimes we as part of the media as well, are, uh, we looked at it like we've got horns on our head, but you you can use that into your advantage as well, because you know how things work and you know how it can be used positively or negatively, right? Yeah, and I do pay a lot of attention to the way that the media reports the stories on our communities. And I think that there is a bias often in the reporting against First Nations, and it, it always returns to funding, and it always returns to, you know, uh, questions of, you know, obligations. But really, I think we can shift that conversation instead to one of opportunity, and we can ask Canadians, you know, do you know enough about treaties? Do you know enough about Aboriginal title? And in teaching them about those things, we can say, listen, these are not obligations. These are a real opportunity to make the country stronger. These are a real opportunity to help uh, us all develop together hand in hand while also tackling like the big injustices that still exist and are confronted by First Nations people. So I think that um, in as much as I do have a lot of experience with the media and have expertise on the other side of the camera, so to speak, uh, I think that I can use that to help shift the conversation um, in a way that is more beneficial to First Nations people and help us advance uh, our needs and our, and our interests. But I should say that, you know, that's work that I take on irregardless of whether I choose to to seek office or not. You know, that's how I see my role, um, you know, in the media is to try and shift the conversation into something that's more accurate, more truthful to where First Nations people are at. Right. Um, I just really liked how you said, and when it goes back to the grassroots and, and, and to find a commonality, a lot of times you see always it's two sides against each other all the time why can we not just find common ground and know that we're all people and we all want the same things we do i mean you you may favor a more conciliatory approach like an approach that's one based more on negotiation or you may favor one that's more confrontational that's that's more about taking a stand but regardless of which approach you favor i think at the end of the day we all want similar things like we want good things for our children. We want language and culture to be strong again, and we want self-determination at the local level. Like we want local communities to be able to decide for themselves how they're going to move forward on things like education, resource development, language and culture, right? right? So if we start from that position of recognizing what we share in common instead of just um, you know, focusing the dispute on, you know, what which is the way forward, I think that we're in a good position. So for me, it's about, yeah, let's let's remember that we're all coming from a good place and that we're, we're all worthy of respect. That's right. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for talking to me today. I have a lot of respect for you, and uh, I wish you the best in the future, whatever you decide to do. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, Bye. you bet. Hi, hi.